Okay, good morning. Um, so uh, I'll, uh, I'll pick up where I left off, but uh, let me just make some remarks. Uh, I, uh, I realize that uh, yesterday's lecture covered a lot of ground and it was uh, probably uh, very difficult to follow everything. Um, uh, I understand that. I don't, I don't really want to apologize for that. The, the point, of, point is that I absolutely cannot pour knowledge into your head. I wish that I could. I'm not able to do that. Uh, my aim was to, uh, to, 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 to cover this material in the sense that you can at least get a feeling for what is involved to really understand the details. And for those of you who are interested, I have actually given you enough to work out the details for yourself. It will take longer than the lecture took, obviously. Um, and another remark I want to make is that today we're going to finish up this more formal material, and then we're going to start with uh, a more phenomenological subject. And you can absolutely understand the rest of the lectures without understanding all the details there. So you can sort of put it in a, in a black box, as I'll discuss. OK? So those are just some preliminary uh, remarks. Um, I, I do want to uh, uh, make one point. I need some chalk. Um, uh, I'm going to back up just a few steps from where I left off to make a very important point that I went uh, um, much too fast over, even by the uh, standards, standards of the rest of the lecture. So let's come back to the uh, gauge covariant kinetic term for chiral multiplets. So without gauge fields, we just have phi dagger phi. With gauge fields, we have this factor here. And here's the component expression. It involves the scalar fields phi, their fermion partners uh, uh, psi. This is, the, okay, this is the normal gauge covariant derivative. There's a d term. Those are all things that I mentioned last time. I completely forgot to mention, and I left it off the slides. I've now put this back. This very, very important term here. This is, a, this is an interaction between the scalar from the chiral multiplet, the fermion from the chiral multiplet, and the fermion from the gauge multiplet, the gauge genome. So in Feynman diagrams, we know that when we have a fermion coupled to a gauge field, we have a vertex like this, right? We have a fermion, fermion, gauge field. So in, the, in supersymmetry, these come from the chiral multiplet. This guy comes from the gauge multiplet. And so what that vertex looks like is like this. Okay, here's the, uh, here's the scalar from the, from the uh, chiral multiplet, the fermion from the chiral multiplet. And we write, it's often useful to write the gauge eno in this way that it's a line with a wiggly thing through it, okay? And so you can see that the, and these diagrams, both this guy looks like G and this guy looks like G, okay? There's a factor of square root two here, right? Which is an actual factor, okay? But you can see that what uh, the, these, di these two vertices are related by supersymmetry and obviously this is a very important uh, uh, effect, okay? All right, any questions on this? Okay, so then uh, the next thing is to write gauge uh, invariant kinetic terms for the gauge multiplet itself, okay? And uh, we have this, uh, this, this combination right here. We talked about this last time. This is a chiral superfield. This is the thing whose lowest component is the gaugeino field, lambda, okay? And we can work out, uh, write a gauge invariant kinetic term by taking a d2 theta integral of this product of w, since these w's are chiral, okay? And we end up with a gauge invariant, uh, a supersymmetry and gauge invariant kinetic term for the gauge multiplet that looks like this, okay? So it has the standard kinetic term for amu, the standard kinetic term for lambda, and this, uh, the square of the auxiliary field. Term. Yes? This is the case for a U1 gauge field, and so the gauge geno is neutral. So just like the gauge boson is neutral, but when we have a non abelian case, there will absolutely be a covariant derivative there. Okay? All right? So in the um, um, now, this uh, auxiliary field D looks a lot like the auxiliary field F for the chiral multiplet. It appears quadratically and without derivatives. And so once again, we can uh, integrate it out, 
right? So to understand the structure of that, let's generalize things a little bit and consider the case where we have n chiral superfields, okay? And let's do this rescaling v to gv so the g's are in the normal uh, standard place that we usually use for phenomenology, okay? And then, uh, what we, then what we have is that the Lagrangian just is generalized by having this sort of sum here, and each of the fields can have its own charge, Q, okay? And then the quadratic terms, they look like there's a D multiplying the sum of uh, quadratic terms for each scalar plus the one-half D squared from the kinetic term. Okay? And if we integrate out d, we can do that by completing the square. We see that we get an extra term uh, to the potential, which is, again, a perfect square, right? Because that's the way it works. And what's inside the square is the sum of phi dagger phi weighted by the charges. Okay? So if we have charges plus minus 1, say, in a, a SUSY version of, of, of QED, this would be the difference of the phi dagger phi's for the two multiplets. Okay? Okay, so, and as with the case of F, this completing the square and doing the path integral is the same as imposing the equation of motion, so we can write, oops, <laughs> that should really be a D, <laughs> okay? V, the D term potential, okay, is one-half D squared, where D is what you get by imposing the equations of motion, right? And you can see again that, uh, that, uh, that, that D, the auxiliary field, is a good order parameter for breaking supersymmetry. Supersymmetry is unbroken if and only, well, if, if D is, if, 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 if supersymmetry is broken if D is non-zero, right? Unbroken supersymmetry requires D to be zero. Okay? Any questions? Okay. All right, so then uh, there's some exercises here if you want to work out, you want to see if you understand these formulas, you can try it out on some, 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 uh, some uh, things here. I'll post this on the, on, the, on the slides. Okay, these slides will be posted. Okay, um, but now, now to generalize this to a non-abelian gauge theory, okay, it's, uh, in, it's the same exact idea for the abelian case, except that now we have one, uh, we have the, we have the, uh, the, the chiral superfields transforming under some non-abelian transformation. So capital T, capital A are the, the generators, say, of SUN, okay? And omega, there's one gauge parameter, which is now a chiral superfield for each generator, okay? So this is the usual generalization of a non-abelian uh, UN trans, SUN transformation, and as, we, as before, the kinetic term is not invariant under this, right, because we can't uh, phi dagger and or omega dagger and omega are different objects, and we use exactly the same kind of trick to make it covariant. We introduce one gauge uh, superfield for each generator, as we would expect, okay, and these VAs are, 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 uh, are real, and then this object here is gauge invariant, but now we can't, uh, you, you know, the, you, the, the, these are now matrices. Omega and V are all matrices, so we can't sort of write this exponential as the exponential of the sum of these things anymore, right? But otherwise, it's just the same thing as before, okay? If we were to expand for small omega, we would see that V at first order shifts just like it did before, but then there are these higher order terms that come from the non-abelian nature. Okay. And we can define components with uh, simple gauge transformation uh, transformations if we observe that this object right here, okay, uh, if you're a, a mathematically inclined person, this is sort of a spinner version of the Moreau-Cartan form, but if not, it's just this what it is. And this thing has a simple transformation property, okay? It looks like it has a piece that transforms like e to the omega, e to the minus omega on both sides, and this derivative right here, okay? So this should remind you of a formula from non-abelian gauge theory, which is that an ordinary non-abelian gauge field transforms in the same way, except that this, except its index is a space-time index, and this derivative is a uh, space-time derivative. So this is kind of like a spinner version of a gauge field, 
Okay, that's exactly what it is. And so that you can sort of follow the same steps. I'm not going to give all the details because your, your mind is probably numb by this point with all these uh, formulas. But uh, you, you, can, you can now sort of follow your nose because you know what to do with this. And you sort of do the same thing with this except with spinner derivatives. Okay. So, uh, uh, and so in particular, uh, you want to define the component fields in terms of covariant derivatives of this combination to get things that have simple gauge transformation properties. Okay, so here are the component fields. Okay, and um, these have, um, I, I, I actually didn't write it down, maybe I should have, but uh, th this thing here transforms like an ordinary gauge field. And these two things transform under gauge transformations like uh, as an adjoint, okay? I'll, I'll add that to the slides, but okay, you're, like I said, you're, your mind is numb. Hope, I'm hoping to wake you up in about uh, a few minutes, okay? The other components vanish in West Amino gauge. Let's not even write them down. And now if you write down the gauge invariant kinetic term, uh, uh, Wow, I left off a bunch of stuff here too. Okay, so uh, the gauge invariant kinetic term here for this, uh, we again have the, 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 the covariant versions of the, the kinetic term for the scalars. We have this, um, yeah, no, it's fine, it's fine, right? We have this term right here, which involves the, uh, the, 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 the gay geno field coupling, this is what I wrote down on the board. And then we have the auxiliary field, DA, and the DA, there's one for every gauge generator, and it's phi dagger TA phi that multiplies that. Okay? Yeah, this, this is correct. Okay? And we again use the same kinds of ideas to, to write the gauge kinetic term. We have this object where again we're using our favorite dude here, the Moreau Cartan form. And this thing transforms in the adjoint representation with chiral superfields. And so we can write, again, a, uh, uh, the kinetic term here. Okay? Now the theta term really does do something. Okay? We're not going to use it in these lectures, but it's actually very important. It plays an important role even in the, the non-renormalization theorems. Okay? But uh, we won't have time to talk about that. And so if you look at the, the complete uh, uh, Lagrangian for a non-abelian gauge theory with some matter field phi, chiral superfield phi, we have a gauge invariant kinetic term, we have a theta term, we have a, uh, a kinetic term for the gay genos with a covariant derivative, and this is the usual adjoint covariant derivative, and we have the d squared terms and the kinetic term here. Okay, so this is the normal adjoint kinetic term for uh, gauge invariant der covariant derivative for, for lambda. Okay. Integrating out the chiral superfields, we get, again, in the abelian case, we had a, the thing that was squared, we get a perfect square, and the thing that was squared in the abelian case was phi dagger phi's weighted by their charges. In this case, it's phi dagger phi weighted by what else? The generators, right? Which are the charges of a non-abelian gauge uh, group. Okay? And I gave an exercise for, for the devout. Okay. Questions? You couldn't wait for it to end. Okay, so uh, that was sort of the end of the, uh, this more formal part of the lectures. Okay, I hope that it was uh, uh, useful or at least a bit inspiring to some of you that you really can, you can do this for yourself. But frankly, when you're actually, you're like me, I'm actually more a phenomenology guy. When you're doing phenomenology, this formalism is very useful to keep track of the symmetries in a manifest way. It's very, very important, as you know, that we understand what the most general thing you can write that's invariant under symmetries is. That's extremely important. To do that, I don't spend my time calculating, you know, anti-commutators of SUSY derivatives, right? Uh, you just use the basic results, okay? So you can think of this somewhat as being a black box. You can just say, look, a chiral superfield is some object that I call phi that is, uh, includes as its components a scalar field, a vial fermion field, and a complex scalar, a vial fermion, and another complex auxiliary field. The, uh, a gauge superfield, let's take the U1 case, contains a gauge geno vial fermion, a real gauge field and a real uh, auxiliary field, 
okay? And then there are magic formulas, right? You're, there's some operation called d2 theta that if you take w, it gives you this in components, and there's an operation called d4 theta that if you do this, it gives you that, etc. cetera, okay? So if you just take the, these are the basic formulas that you need to understand everything in the rest of the lecture, okay? So you can treat it a bit like magic even though, well, it's true, okay? All right. So, <clears throat> supersymmetry is broken in nature. It's a beautiful symmetry, right? Just there, there are people who spend their whole lives in unbroken supersymmetry, their whole lives as physicists, but we're not going to do that because we're interested in making contact with the real world, okay? Now, this is, again, a vast subject, and I cannot do it justice, but I will try to give you a few highlights and... Um, and hopefully get, get a bit of an overview of the subject. So obviously we don't see, uh, super, we don't live in a supersymmetric world. Now let me just make some very general remarks about uh, supersymmetry breaking. Uh, uh, the idea of supersymmetry is that at some level it's an exact symmetry of nature, right? Well, let's say this. Um, supersymmetry is, uh, is a, is a space-time symmetry, as I kept I'm saying over and over again. So if I want to include gravity, I need to gauge it, right? Ordinary Einstein gravity involves gauging the Lorentz group, the space-time symmetries, and supersymmetry forces you then to gauge the full um, supersymmetry algebra, actually, okay? And... Um, that means that it doesn't, just like in an ordinary gauge theory, we don't have the option to do explicit breaking. We have to break uh, gauge symmetry spontaneously if you want to have a consistent description, okay? Just a parenthetical remark, if you don't understand this, then wipe it from your memory. It's not actually quite true what I've said. It's actually the case that explicit breaking is the same as spontaneous breaking for gauge theories. But if you didn't understand that, forget about it, okay? Anyway, we want to break things spontaneously, and that means that what we're looking for is a supersymmetry invariant Lagrangian whose ground state breaks supersymmetry. That's what we must have, okay? And so we don't have the option just to say, well, supersymmetry, it's like the, it's like the approximate uh, uh, isospin invariance in the strong interaction. It's, it's, it's an approximate symmetry, but it doesn't have any, it never becomes an exact symmetry in any sense. It uh, doesn't have to anyway. Supersymmetry has to become an exact symmetry if it plays a role in nature. So, um, now from, so we need to look at spontaneous breaking. We need to find a SUSY invariant Lagrangian whose ground state breaks supersymmetry. And we know that that happens if and only if the, va the vacuum energy is positive. Right? We know that from general principles. And at the classical level, the potential is just uh, a sum of squares. Okay? There's, a, there's a square of an F term for every chiral superfield, and there's a square of a D term for every gauge superfield. Right? That's the classical potential. And each of these terms is positive, and so we, need, we see that supersymmetry is unbroken if and only if all these Fs and Ds are zero, and conversely, if we want supersymmetry to broke, be broken, at least one of them must be non-zero. Okay. So this tells us what to look for. We're looking for theories that have VEVs for some of these auxiliary fields. Okay? It's really not very hard to write down a theory like this. Okay? So uh, I'm only going to talk about the very simplest uh, example. This is the Poloni model. And the model is excruciatingly simple. In fact, this is a bit of a lie, as we'll see. But uh, let's consider something. Whoops, this is a d4 theta. OK, d4 theta. Uh, the ordinary, a single chiral superfield, ordinary kinetic term, and the linear superpotential term. OK, only a linear term. Well, what does this actually do? Well, if I look at the f term, it's the derivative of omega, which is just the coefficient of the linear term. So it's non-zero. So according to my. My, my thing there, supersymmetry is broken, okay? Now that seems a little bit cheap because how can I get that from just a quadratic plus linear Lagrangian? How can that do anything? And the answer is it can't, really, because if I just work out what this thing does in component fields, it's just a free theory, okay? It's just that somehow I've added a non-zero vacuum energy to it, okay? So this only breaks supersymmetry in a very formal way. It is true that the generators Q are broken, but it's not, there's no interesting SUSY breaking dynamics. There's no interesting dynamics at all. 
the VEV is undetermined. So you might think this is just silly. But it's not actually silly, because a minor modification of this actually gives me a theory that genuinely breaks supersymmetry. So uh, give it some non-trivial interactions, but put these interactions into the Kähler potential, into the d4 theta term. So up till now, we've been talking about uh, renormalizable theories, and that's perfectly fine. But we know that when we include gravity, the low energy theory certainly contains non-renormalizable interactions. If we have any sort of heavy fields and integrate them out, we expect effects like this, okay? In fact, this Poloni model is universally the low energy effective theory that arises from the O'Rafferty mechanism. So the O'Rafferty mechanism, I'm not gonna talk about, but it's the thing that most reviews of supersymmetry talk about. And this exact thing happens. You generate a term like this from integrating out heavy things. In any case, uh, let's just add this term, okay? And so the same machinery that we use to work out the component fields of this can be used for that. And what we find is that instead of just having f dagger f uh, from this term right here, we have an f dagger f uh, minus, we have this term right here. Okay, and here I've written only the terms, there are lots of other terms from this involving fermions, all kinds of other stuff, but here I only care about the scalar potential, so I'm only writing the terms that involve no derivatives and uh, involve the scalar fields, okay? Now we can eliminate F using its equation of motion, and now we find a non-trivial potential, okay? And this potential uh, has a minimum uh, at phi equals zero, Okay? So it has a non-trivial minimum. You can work out the masses and so on, right? Okay? So if you work out the masses, just taking the second derivative of the potential, you find that the scalar mass is non-zero. That makes sense. The potential has fixed it, so it has some second derivative. And I haven't shown you about the fermions, but the fermion does not get a mass from this. Okay? From this. It's, it's actually not hard to, to, to see. You can just easily check that there is no psi psi term anywhere in that, uh, in, that, in that thing, okay? All right, so there's a model that, that, that breaks supersymmetry, no, no problem, okay? Now the fact that we found that this theory has a massless fermion uh, is extremely general, okay? Because we have spontaneously broken a global symmetry here, namely supersymmetry, right? And whenever we have an ordinary global symmetry, a U1 or SUN or something, that breaks, we know that we have one Nambu-Goldstone boson for every broken generator. And if we have a massless Nambu-Goldstone boson for every broken generator, right? And so in the case of supersymmetry, what we're breaking is uh, some fermionic symmetries, Q alpha, or they're global symmetries, we're breaking them spontaneously. And so we should expect a massless uh, fermion, Goldstino, it's called, right? We expect a Goldstino uh, to come, ari come arise from this, okay? So it's, at least it shouldn't be surprising, okay? And in fact, you can prove this in great generality, just like there's a sort of an operator level proof for the Goldstone theorem in, uh, in, in, in ordinary, for ordinary symmetries, there's a similar proof for, uh, for, for supersymmetry as well. So this is exactly as general as the ordinary existence of ordinary Goldstone bosons. So we're not, I'm not gonna show that, but let me just show it to you in the very uh, simplest case, which is, let, well, let's consider a general theory of uh, an arbitrary um, superpotential. Only chiral fields and an arbitrary superpotential. Then the potential looks like this, right? It's the square of F, which is this, okay, summed over these guys. And so if we minimize the potential, minimizing the potential, if we treat phi and phi dagger as independent fields, we have to satisfy this equation right here, okay? But if you look at this, you see that supersymmetry breaking in this theory means that the F term has to be non-zero, so this is non-zero, right? Okay, this is non-zero. But that means that this piece right here has a zero eigenvalue, a non-trivial zero eigenvector, sorry, right? That's exactly what this equation says. But this thing right here is exactly the fermion mass matrix. Okay, voila. All right. There's a, there's a similar proof, only slightly more complicated if you take, include D terms. Okay. So there's always going to be a Goldstino. Okay. Now again, 
by our analogy with uh, gauge theories, if we have an ordinary, if we, sorry, or, ordinary symmetries, ordinary uh, bosonic symmetries, if we gauge the symmetry, if we gauge a symmetry that's spontaneously broken, we know what happens, right? What happens is that if the, if the generator is gauged, then instead of having a massless Nambu-Goldstone boson, the, Nam, the, the, the Nambu-Goldstone boson becomes the longitudinal component of the gauge field, a massive gauge field via the Higgs mechanism, right? And so we might very well expect that when we have supergravity, Okay? Supergravity contains a graviton, a spin two particle, and the gravitino, a spin three halves particle. That when we, since that is gauging supersymmetry, uh, if we spontaneously break supersymmetry, we might expect that the, the, uh, the, 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 gold, the goldstino becomes the longitudinal component of the gravitino and gives us a massive spin three halves field. Okay? And that is indeed what happens. Okay, so what happens in the context of, um, of supergravity is that we get a massive spin three halves field, okay, and the, its mass is proportional to the gravitational coupling times the VEV. The gravitational coupling is one over M Planck, and the breaking term is, is F. The breaking parameter is F, which has dimension two, okay, so this has dimensions of a mass, okay, and this is indeed what happens, okay. So this is, again, a vast subject, which I'm only alluding to here. But the point here is to be aware of the fact that, of course, M Planck is the biggest scale that we think we can talk about with a straight face in, uh, in, 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 in particle physics, right? And so F can be, at most, if we imagine that Susie's broken at the Planck scale, F would be M Planck squared. Now, if Susie's already broken at the highest scale possible in nature, it's probably not useful symmetry. So we're always interested in the case where F is small compared to M Planck. That means we always have a light gravitino. We're often interested in the case where F is much smaller than M Planck. For example, you might think that the most natural value for F would be TeV squared, in which case this would be a very, very small number. So these very light gravitinos can have, they're very light, they're certainly light enough that we need, should perhaps worry about them, and they do in fact have interesting consequences for phenomenology, collider phenomenology, and cosmology, okay? And I will allude to that, to that a little bit later, okay? But obviously, I'm not going to go into the formalism here. Okay, any questions on this? Okay. Now, as we talked about at the, the beginning of the first lecture, and uh, as uh, Andrea Wulzer also uh, reviewed very nicely. The motivation for extending the standard model, the main motivation for extending it is the, the hierarchy problem, or the only motivation that points to new physics specifically at the TeV scale. And if supersymmetry is going to solve the hierarchy problem, therefore, the superpartners of the observed particles must have masses of order the TeV scale, okay? With a tiny, with a little caveat that we'll talk about later, okay? So, you might think, it's very natural to think from what you've heard so far, that the most natural possibility is that there's some sort of a Higgs sector, maybe, not, maybe something like that Poloni model that I talked about, maybe something fancier, maybe something renormalizable. That's easy to write theories like that. And that Higgs sector, some fields get VEVs, just like the Higgs gets a VEV, and they get VEVs of order a, a TeV or hundreds of GeV, and that breaks supersymmetry. And so just like we discovered the Higgs in 2012, the Higgs that breaks electroweak symmetry, we can hope to discover this super Higgs sector that breaks supersymmetry at the TeV scale, okay? That would be fantastic. Uh, unfortunately, it's not possible. And the reason it's not possible is because if you search through your black box of formulas for the, uh, for the, the, the couplings of, in, in supersymmetric theories, you will never find a scalar Gageino Gageino coupling. Okay? There's no coupling like that. Okay? And that's what you need to give the Gageino a mass from a theory like this, right? You would need to write, find some coupling of the Higgs to the Gageino because, for example, we certainly have not seen the uh, Glueino, the colored superpartner of the gluon, right? the fermionic, that would be an octet fermion. We certainly haven't seen a light version of that. Okay? 
And so there isn't any way to, gen to, to generate a mass for the gay genome at tree level, so the gay genome mass is just way too small in a scenario like that. So this just doesn't work. Okay? <clears throat> there are a number of possibilities that you can use that do work. There are plenty of things that do work. There's so many of them, I'm barely going to scratch the surface again. Okay? Um, some of the possibilities are that we say, okay, uh, you know, if tree level doesn't work, we need to have effects that are loop level effects, but they need to be very big. So basically, we need to have strong supersymmetry breaking at the TEV scale. That would certainly be ex very exciting. It's very hard to make models like this, although some have tried, including me. Another thing you can do that works is to have super partner effects from super partners coming from loop effects. So the loops make them smaller, but all you need to do is make the supersymmetry breaking scale a bit higher. So this, for example, the, the, the most famous version of this is, uh, is, is gauge mediation, but there's also anomaly mediation. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, something like a technicolor sector that instead of breaking uh, electroweak symmetry, it breaks supersymmetry. Okay? You know. It sounds, sounds reasonable. I mean, I, I, it, it's, uh, and I, it may be reasonable. It may actually be reasonable. <laughs> OK. All right. Um, so the, 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 but there, are, there, are very, there aren't any concrete models because we don't know very much about these kinds of theories. Okay? Actually, we know enough about these kinds of theories to know it's not so easy to make these first models. Okay? So uh, however, we can make successful models of the second kind. Uh, for example, gauge mediation or anomaly mediation are two, two versions of this, okay? where we just have perturbative loop effects that generate the observed superpartner masses from an initially higher scale of supersymmetry breaking. And then there's hidden sector SUSY breaking, which is what I'm going to uh, talk about a little bit more detail. Okay? So what is hidden sector supersymmetry breaking? Here the idea is that the Lagrangian of the world sort of approximately, should have written this down, but that we have some hidden fields, x, and then we have the standard model fields, and then the Lagrangian of the world uh, splits up into a, uh, uh, a piece that involves just the standard model fields and a piece that involves just the hidden sector plus some higher dimension operators. Okay. So that's, that's what I mean by a hidden sector, okay? And these higher dimension operators can be suppressed by some large scale, one over m, so the typical size of effects in that, that, uh, that, uh, that uh, uh, the connection is, is, is small, right? Okay? And then this hidden sector can break supersymmetry, uh, for example, this Poloni model or something. Let's say there's some uh, hidden field X, hidden vector chiral superfield, and it has an F term that is non-zero. Okay? If there are many Xs in the hidden sector that have a, a, an F term, I can just take a linear, find the linear combination that has an F term, and the other ones have zero F term, kind of like the Higgs basis in electroweak symmetry breaking. Okay? So I can always shift the lowest component of x to make the VEV zero, so that as far as low energy physics is concerned, the effects of x are, are the most important effect of x are just given by its VEV, which is just an F term, OK? And the F term is non-zero because of the, the dynamics in the hidden sector. So now let's think about what kinds of higher dimension operators here can we write down? OK? Obviously, we haven't talked about this sector yet. How do we supersymmetrize the standard model? We're getting to that. OK? Um, what kinds of effects can we write down? OK? Well, we want to write down effects uh, which are uh, uh, basically powers of, of x over m. OK? And remember, so, so what we do is we basically, wherever we had some coupling before, some, some coupling in the Lagrangian, we can now, uh, that gave us some supersymmetry invariant, we can now just put powers of x over m. Okay? So for example, the ordinary uh, one type of invariant we can write is the gauge 
uh, kinetic term, and we had some coefficient here, but now we can just write x over m times this, right? This is a d2 theta integral, so we have to put in a chiral superfield, but x does the job perfectly. And now, because x has a theta squared component, that, is, that theta squared component is picked out by this d2 theta term here, and as far as the potential terms go, we get a gauge genome mass, okay? So right away, before, when we tried to, if we tried to write down some renormalizable theory, the big problem is that we couldn't write a gauge genome mass. Immediately we see we can write a gauge genome mass, which is of order f over m, okay? And similarly for the scalars, the kinetic term for the scalars is, x, has, is phi dagger phi. We can take its coefficient to be x dagger x over m squared, and we find a contribution to the scalar mass. Now we have two f's that can be eaten by these uh, d4 thetas, and so we get immediately a scalar mass. So we get a scalar mass, which is f over m, scalar mass squared, which is f over m squared, and we see that this is successful in the sense that these guys are naturally of the same order of magnitude, right? If we have the same scale m suppressing both of these operators, then the scalar mass and the gay genome mass are the same order of magnitude, okay? <clears throat> there are more things that you can write down, okay? So scalar and gay genome masses uh, are, are is, well, that you may think that's enough because that, that's sort of all the superpartner uh, uh, mass, kinds of mass terms we would want, but there, there are actually more things you can write down. Um, for example, um, we can write down, for when we have superpotential terms, for example, a cubic superpotential term, we could write down uh, uh, some x over m here, and we could get cubic scalar interactions, okay? We could also write down um, terms like this, where we put in just an x in the d4 theta integral. We could get terms like this, it's a little bit less clear what these terms are because it involves an auxiliary field of phi. So to see what this does, let's integrate out the auxiliary field phi in the presence of this term. And what we see is that it modifies the f term. Basically, the f term is the square of the coefficient of, lin of the linear term of f. And so what we get is a new term like this, which is again, like this over here, is actually a cubic self-interaction in the case of a cubic superpotential. Okay, and again, all of the uh, Susie breaking mass terms we get from this are of order f over m. So this very, very simple prescription, which is just include all the higher dimension operators uh, with x suppressed by the same scale m, gives us a whole host of different kinds of supersymmetry breaking masses, all of the same order of magnitude. So this, very gener this looks very generic and looks like it's very easy to get all the superpartner masses of the same size. Okay. Okay, so that's just what I'm saying here. Okay, that is that uh, the message I'm trying to give you is that 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 it's very uh, now. Of course, we could put in higher order terms suppressed by additional powers of x over m. Nobody tells you to stop. Okay, and those just give you smaller effects. Okay, so life is good. Okay. Um, now, what I want you to note is that if the, if the Susie breaking, if the scale f, for example, if, 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 the, if the scale m here, then what is the scale m? Well, let's suppose the scale m was m Planck, because we certainly know that there are higher dimension operators suppressed by powers of m Planck from supergravity. Okay? There may be even bigger effects, but we could, we could imagine that situation. Then if you work out what f needs to be in order to get uh, TeV scale masses, it's about 10 to the 11 GeV all squared, okay? And so it's some enormous scale. So we would expect the dynamics that break supersymmetry is at inaccessibly large scales in a model like that, okay? And um, therefore, we could integrate out all the heavy particles, all the dynamics that actually break supersymmetry could be integrated out at that very high scale. But what's left, what's important to us at low energy is the VEV, Fx, right? Okay? And so for, for us, down at, you know, down at the TeV scale, it looks just as if supersymmetry is explicitly broken, okay? But explicitly broken by the F component of some chiral superfield, okay? And this is, uh, okay, this looks just like explicit breaking, okay? And so this actually uh, leads to a, 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 a 
a, a phenomenological approach, okay, we can say, okay, look, it's since we don't know whether we're ever going to be able to under, see uh, in experiments the SUSY breaking dynamics, the sort of Higgs sector that breaks supersymmetry, it may be at inaccessibly high scales. So given the fact that we haven't seen any sign of supersymmetry, let's just take a very phenomenological approach, okay, and let's just break supersymmetry explicitly, okay, and just assume that all the superpartners are at the TeV scale, okay? And we can ask from that phenomenological approach, a more bottom-up approach, what are the allowed breakings that we could have? What are the allowed breakings that we could imagine, okay? So if we don't want to use any particular UV model to see what we can have. Well, the basic bottom-up constraint is that when we break supersymmetry, of course, one way to break supersymmetry is just to write the standard model. Well, that's supersymmetric, okay? But we know that doesn't solve the problem. We know that what we're, that we're trying to do is we're trying to introduce the superpartners and also introduce sub-Z breaking, but in such a way that we don't introduce any new quadratic sensitivity to UV physics. That's the hierarchy problem. We want to have supersymmetry and have it broken exactly in such a way that it uh, solves the hierarchy problem. We'd like to find out what that is, what's the most general way, okay? And by the way, uh, these two things that I've, this is actually linked to what I've just talked about, namely the hidden sector SUSY breaking, because you would certainly hope that the hidden sector breaking that I just talked about has this property, right? You would want to hope, you would hope that this spontaneous breaking by the hidden sector, this hidden sector dynamics which I talked about doesn't, uh, doesn't uh, if I have Susie breaking at some very high scale, that that still solves the hierarchy problem, okay? So all of this, the technical term we say is that we need supersymmetry breaking to be soft, okay? Questions on this, is that clear? Okay. All right, and uh, so let's understand this constraint. Let's understand what is the most general, super, explicit supersymmetry breaking, which is soft, okay? And uh, let's explore this in the context of uh, th this sort of simple model here. I just have a single chiral superfield and a single gauge field, okay? And um, you can easily generalize this to, to more indices, but this, is, this, is, this, will be, this will be enough for us, okay? And let's understand what we can do, okay? So notice that I have written the couplings here, okay? In particular, the coefficients of the kinetic terms, I've written them as S and Z, so these are superfields, okay? So I'm allowing the couplings to be superfield. This trick is going to be useful again, okay? As it was before. We used this to prove the non-renormalization theorem, right? And the idea was that we can promote these guys to, to superfields. S is a chiral superfield, Z is a real superfield, and these superpotential couplings are chiral superfields, okay? Um, so the SUSY non-renormalization theorem that we, that we, we proved last uh, lecture um, shows that this Lagrangian that I've written down has only logarithmic renormalization, and it only has renormalization of Z and S. I didn't talk about the renormalization of S. It's sad because it's such a beautiful subject, but we don't have time. But trust me, it's log, I mean, it's, you don't have to trust me, actually. You know, in components, this is a gauge coupling, and a gauge coupling is only logarithmically renormalized, okay? So you don't have to know the beautiful theory, but uh, okay? So there are only logarithmic divergences in the SUSY limit, right? If I don't break supersymmetry, there are only logarithmic uh, sensitivity to UV physics. And now we want to preserve that feature when we include SUSY breaking, right? But there's a really simple way to do that, an incredibly simple way to do that, okay? Which is just to take all of these superfield couplings and turn on theta-dependent terms in them, right? So I'm changing the Lagrangian. I'm explicitly breaking supersymmetry by allowing higher terms, higher theta-dependent terms in these superfields, okay? So you agree that that breaks supersymmetry, okay? I hope. The question is, does it break supersymmetry softly? And the answer is, of course. 
Why, of course? Because I just, the whole point of the non the, the whole way I thought about the non renormalization theorem was to say that, look, you can do all your calculations treating all these things, Zs and kappas and all these things, you can treat them as superfields, okay, as a theorist. And all the results just go through, okay? So if I can treat them as superfields, I can treat them as superfields with non zero theta components, which is what I'm now doing, okay? So a little more concretely, if I imagine, well, what kind of, what kind of logarithmically divergent, what kind of logarithmic divergences do I get? If I write them in superspace, I find, for example, a logarithmic divergence in the kinetic term, phi dagger phi, right? And its coefficient is lambda dagger lambda, okay? And there's a z, right? Now, if z, lambda, and, and z and little lambda are superfields with non-zero theta components, you can just expand this out and you can see what divergences you get that involve the, uh, the SUSY breaking terms. Okay? This is very simple, but it's very profound. Okay? Any questions on this? There's, there is one subtlety in this argument. There's a, there's a, there's a few subtleties, and they're, you know, they're, they're minor things. They have to do with basically classifying all possible effects. They're not that subtle. But uh, one, you have to be a little, one thing you have to be a little careful about is uh, you can also have a, a logarithmic divergence of this kind right here. Okay? So this thing right here is d4 theta times a logarithmic divergence times phi, a single power of phi. Now, why didn't we include such a term in our original Lagrangian? Why didn't I write d4 theta times phi? Okay. Well, the answer is because if phi is a um, chiral superfield, then d4 theta of phi is a total derivative. So it doesn't matter in the action. Okay? So its logarithmic divergence also doesn't matter unless these guys have non-zero higher components. Okay? Then this thing, including in particular the mu dagger right here, has got an antichiral bit in it, and this is not a total derivative. Okay? And so uh, this effect is linear in phi, so it only happens if I have uh, a, a gauge singlet phi, and it happens actually from, this one, from a one-loop diagram like this that comes from the uh, cubic coupling from, uh, from lambda. Okay. All right. But this is but this is the basic idea. The big idea is that that if since there are logarithmic divergences when you when these coupling superfields are just pure numbers, I have the same logarithmic divergences in a sense when they are superfields. Okay? And you can work out many properties of uh, Susie, loops and super Susie breaking theories using these ideas. Okay, any questions? Yes? So are you saying that the set of the potential is still I'll repeat it. I'm sorry, say again? Are you saying that the set of the potential The question is, am I saying that in this setup, the super potential is still not renormalized? The answer is absolutely, okay, absolutely. When before I said that you could, uh, you could do the renormalization theory with the couplings treated as superfields, I really meant it. I really meant it. Now there really are superfields. Okay? That's all I'm saying. <laughs> okay? Other questions? Yeah. Yes. Okay, the question is, before I was treating these couplings as superfields, as spurions, they didn't have kinetic terms. Now, if they come from, say, a hidden sector, uh, SUSY breaking, they do have kinetic terms. And so doesn't that change things? Okay, I believe that's the question, right? Well, the answer is, it changes things, but only a tiny, 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 tiny bit, okay? If the scale of supersymmetry breaking is very high, 
okay, then all of the physical excitations of the sector that breaks supersymmetry, except for the Goldsteino, okay, but that's a fermion, but all the scalars, okay, have, um, have masses which are much larger, which are at the scale f, which say is 10 to the 11 GeV or some very high scale. And so I can integrate them out. When I integrate them out, I write a, a, an effective theory that has no hidden sector fields at all in it. So that's this theory. There, it's true that there is the Goldstino, so I lied to you just a little bit because the Goldstino survives, or maybe the Gravitino. It can be much lighter. But that means that I have to add some terms to this that just depend on this extra fermion. They are not going to change the soft Susie breaking. Okay? Does that make sense? All right. In fact, let me just say that you can even think of the auxiliary field in this way. The auxiliary field, notice, is a term that has a mass but no kinetic term, right? I can think of it as having a very large mass and an ordinary kinetic term. Right? So you can think of the auxiliary field as sort of an infinitely heavy field if you want. So, well, I don't know if that helped or hurt, but anyway. Okay. All right. Okay. <clears throat> so you can ask, okay, everything that I get in this way is soft. Okay, everything I get by taking a coupling constant and turning on some higher uh, components of it is soft breaking. Is there anything else that's soft? Okay, and actually the answer is, uh, well, okay, here you have to be a little bit careful. I, 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 I feel Howie Haber looking over on my shoulder and uh, worrying about subtleties. But essentially, uh, the answer is no, okay? The, the, the point is that, that you can write even the things that are not uh, that are not gotten in this way, you can analyze them by thinking about uh, uh, thinking about them as higher components of some superfield. So, for example, let's suppose, notice that the cubic terms that I've been able to write so far, which I've said are soft breaking, are holomorphic. They always look like phi cubed plus Hermitian conjugate. Suppose my aim in life is to write non-holomorphic cubic terms. That's my aim in life. Okay, don't ask why, but it is. Okay then I can write that in superspace by just introducing some new, in a really cheap way, by just writing d4 theta x times phi dagger phi squared, where x has got a non-zero highest component, like this, okay? Now I can ask, is that soft? And the answer is no, it's not soft. Why? Because x now has dimension um, whatever, three, right. No, that doesn't sound right. Uh, no, H has dimension one. X actually has dimension minus one. Sorry, X has dimension minus one. Remember, theta has dimension minus a half, okay? So this X, should have written this down, X has dimension minus one, okay? So since it has a negative mass dimension, it generally has power, if I think of it as a coupling with ne negative mass dimension, it has power divergences. So I can get a, a quadratic divergence like this, okay? Which looks like that, okay? Now, the reason that, that Howie would, would object is because, you see, I only have this kind of divergence if phi is a gauge singlet. If I don't have a gauge singlet, I don't have this, and I can claim this is soft, okay? However, however, um, I didn't say it here, okay? However, uh, there's no good UV, remember, there's a sort of synergy between these two kinds of uh, ideas. One is this hidden sector Susie breaking where I, I found that there were actual chiral superfields or actual superfields that got VEVs and that was what broke supersymmetry. And now I've shown that that's what gives you soft breaking, right? If you turn on sort of non-standard soft breaking like this, there's no good UV model for, for these kinds of effects, okay? So we will, when we talk about soft breaking, we'll always talk about these things you can get from turning on higher components of superfields, okay? Questions on this? Okay. So the summary is that for our purposes, soft SUSY breaking is equivalent to turning on higher components of superfields. Okay. These are exactly the effects that we would expect if SUSY is broken in a hidden sector. And this is a great starting point for phenomenological treatment of supersymmetry. Okay. Okay, so now 
we're going to talk about the, uh, the, the how to apply supersymmetry to the real world to uh, particle physicists, the minimal supersymmetric standard model is the MSSM. To the rest of the world, I guess it's the main school of science and mathematics, where maybe they, dis I think they actually uh, study the minimal supersymmetric standard model here because their symbol is a bunch of penguins sitting around waiting for something to happen. Okay? Okay? Okay, so uh, even this. Uh, is a vast subject, the minimal supersymmetric standard model. Okay, so there are many things I'm not going to be able to cover. I recommend, for more details, I, I recommend this reference. It's a standard reference. It's very nice. It was originally written in 97, but he's updating it all the time, so it's, it's current. You don't have to worry that it's out of date. Okay, it unfortunately uses the non-standard metric, but what can you do? Okay. Okay, so now let's try to imagine how the real world could be supersymmetric, our world, okay? So we have to start with the standard model. And the first thing is, let's translate the standard model into our language of left-handed vial fermions, okay? So we don't go nuts. Uh, uh, we, are, you know, we have to use left-handed vial fermions for everything in a supersymmetric theory. So it's very simple. I had the standard model wallet card before, and I had uh, what I had for the fermions with both left and right-handed fermions. But I need to convert the, the right-handed guys to be left-handed. And so, for example, whereas before I had a U right, I now have a left-handed bile fermion U, which I call U C, which has gauge conjugate quantum numbers compared to what I had before. Okay? So uh, this is just a rewriting here. Okay, so for example, UC is just UR dagger times an epsilon thingy. Okay? All right, and the, Q, the, the Qs, for example, are just the lowercase Qs. Okay? So this is the standard model wallet card. We just write down the most general interactions compatible with the gauge symmetries of these fields, and that is the standard model. Okay? So now, to embed this in a supersymmetric theory, it's quite simple, right? I, every fermion in the standard model now needs to be part of a chiral superfield. So for every, for example, for the left-handed left quark doublet, I need this, this is, here it is. It's now the theta term in a chiral superfield. And so there must be a complex scalar, which I denote by Q tilde, that is its partner, okay? And it's traditional to name these guys by putting an S in front of the name. So this is a quark, this is a squark, right? And so on. And, you know, an up quark becomes an up squark. So one complex scalar for every vial fermion. Okay? And the gauge fields, for every gauge field, I have SU3 cross SU2 cross U1 gauge fields of the standard model. For each gauge field, I need to put it in its own gauge supermultiplet. Okay? And so for every gauge field, for every generator, for all eight of these guys, for all three of these guys, I need to introduce a gauge multiplet, which has, in addition to the gauge field, a vial fermion. So now there's one vial fermion for every gauge field that's been added. Okay, and um, these are named by putting eno at the end of the name. So a gauge boson becomes a gauge eno, gluon a gluino, and a W boson becomes a wino, not a wino. Okay. What about the Higgs doublet? Okay, so now let's talk about the Higgs. The Higgs is the one scalar that we've seen. Right? The fact that we've seen what appears to all, as far as we can tell, as an elementary scalar is one of the main motivations for supersymmetry, after all. We should remember that in this sea of all this formalism. Um, and um, you might briefly think for about a nanosecond, you might realize, you might go back and say, hey, wait a minute, you know, uh, if I go back here, I can see that actually this Higgs scalar has the same quantum number as this L, 
well, okay, the hypercharge is opposite, but that's really just a convention because I could just use H dagger, right, or H tilde, whatever. I could conjugate H and get something that has a minus hypercharge, right? So, hey, why, why not put H in the same, you know, make H a super partner of L, okay? You might think about that for a nanosecond, but that's a really terrible idea because then when the Higgs gets a VEV, I'm going to break lepton number and let's just not go there, okay? Um, that's a really bad idea, so we really need, uh, the Higgs needs its very own, uh, it's, Higgs needs its very own chiral superfield, where the Higgs doublet is the lowest component, and then we have an, a vial fermion, the Higgs Zeno. Okay? So we have, we, have, we have essentially doubled the number of degrees of freedom in the standard model. We've added one superpartner for every observed particle just by embedding these things in these supermultiplets that we've been talking about. Okay? So now the idea is, great, now we know what the particle content is. Let's just start writing down the allowed supersymmetric interactions, and let's see what we've got, okay? So we have kinetic terms for everybody. That's a good start, okay? But I hope I don't need to write them down. We know what they are. We have kinetic terms for everybody. Good. What kinds of interactions? That automatically gives us all of the standard model gauge interactions. Those are coming for free. Okay, so all the standard model gauge interactions are present just because we have a supersymmetric gauge theory. So the only non-trivial thing we have to worry about is the superpotential. Okay, and now things get uh, interesting. Okay, if we if we just say we're just following the wall, the wallet card approach, right? I just write down everything that's allowed by the gauge quantum numbers. Uh, from what I've said so far, I have this these guys right here. I have a whole bunch of terms. Okay. Now, this first term right here, this is a, a left-handed quark, a Higgs doublet, and a, uh, a right-handed up quark, okay? So this has, contains, contains in it Yukawa couplings, right? If I remember the component expression for this, if I work out the components, this contains an ordinary Yukawa coupling. So that's great, okay? That's fantastic. What are all these other terms? What are all these other terms? Well, this is a coupling of three quarks, okay? This is an operator that has the quantum numbers of a neutron, right? An up quark and two down quarks. It's a color singlet because I've contracted, I haven't shown it here, but I've contracted the color indices using a three index epsilon symbol, okay? This is bad because it violates baryon number, okay? One of the really beautiful features of the standard model is that I cannot write down anything that violates baryon number at renormalizable level, right? Andrea Volzer uh, reviewed this very nicely yesterday in yesterday's lecture, okay? But here I can. So how is it that I'm imposing more symmetry and yet I can, you know, supersymmetry, and yet I can write down terms that violate these symmetries? Well, because if I work out what this really is in the Lagrangian, it involves, say, a quark-quark-squark coupling. It's a Yukawa coupling between two quarks and a squark, okay? And so because I've introduced the scalars, squarks, which I didn't have in the standard model, I can write down a renormalizable theory that breaks baryon number, okay? That's not so good, right? And similarly here, this term violates baryon number and lepton number. This one violates lepton number. This one violates lepton number. Okay, not so good. Now, there's, um, and also, I do not have any Yukawa couplings to, that involve the, uh, the, the right-handed down quark or the right-handed electron. Okay, so I have too many of these violators and not enough of these guys that I want. Okay. And here, again, the holomorphy of the superpotential is critical because in the standard model, the way I get with one Higgs field, Yukawa couplings for all the fermions, is I make use of the fact that I can use H and H dagger to write, uh, uh, to write um, Yukawa couplings. But in the superpotential, because of the restrictiveness of holomorphy, I cannot write things like Q dagger, H dagger, DC. It's not supersymmetric. Okay, so supersymmetry doesn't allow me to do that. Now, of course, I could also have chosen to put the Higgs, uh, 
the scalar Higgs doublet into a field H tilde that has the opposite quantum numbers. And then I could have written uh, Yukawa couplings involving D and E, but not Yukawa couplings involving U, right? Can't have both. And I can still write all this stuff here. Actually, sorry, I couldn't write this. So th this one would be gone in that case because there's this, this is H tilde now. So this one would be gone, okay? All right? But it still has the same problems. I mean, it has essentially the same problems, okay? So uh, now let's deal, we have to deal with these problems one at a time, okay? So one thing is we need to have both Yukawa couplings for all the fermions. So what we do is we introduce two completely different chiral superfield H up and H down. So we're forced to introduce two Higgses, two Higgs superfields, okay? They're usually called H up and H down. Okay, so let's do that. Let's extend the model even further. And then what we have is we have this. We now have everything. And sorry, I guess this is H up here. Okay, this should be an H up here. Okay, so we have, now we have everything. We have all the Yukawa couplings that we want, namely here. We can also write a, a, a quadratic term, H up, H down. And we still have all this stuff that we don't want. Okay. So now at least we have all the stuff that we want. We can worry about the stuff that we don't want in a little bit. And this gives us the wallet card for the MSSM. In other words, the each, everything here is now a chiral superfield, right? Has both uh, scalars and fermions. And here are the gauge quantum numbers. And we have two Higgs doublets that have opposite hypercharge. Okay. Questions on this? So now, we're just going to assume that all these terms that violate baryon number and lepton number are just absent, okay? We'll come back to that assumption in a little bit because it turns out that that assumption has very far-reaching implications beyond even the, uh, the, the, you know, the, the violation of baryon and lepton number, as we'll see, okay? But we'll just make that assumption for now, okay? Um, for reasons that I refuse to explain right now, these terms are usually called R parity violating terms. Okay? I absolutely refuse to explain why that is right now because I think that at this point in the logical order, we should just say, look, we can easily, those, symmetry, those guys could be forbidden just because, for example, baryon and lepton number are good approximate symmetries of nature. That's just how it works. Okay? We don't have to introduce something as exotic as R parity just yet. Okay? All right, so with that assumption, here is the, the, the super potential that we have, and I've written out all the flavor indices here. So I and J go from one to three, they are the flavor indices, to emphasize the fact that we have the full three generation flavor structure of the, the standard model, and we have this mu term right here. I have not written the gauge indices, but they are contracted in the obvious way. Q is a three, for example, and UC is a three bar. So this one would have an upper color index and this a lower color index. There are also SU2 indices that would be contracted between this guy and that guy and so on. Okay, but that's just like in the standard model. All right. So this looks pretty good. We have all three generations of Yukawa couplings. We have a sort of a Higgs mass term. Looks pretty good. Right? And all we've had to do is to impose some global symmetries to get rid of some of these terms that violate lepton number and baryon number. Okay? Now you sometimes have people, hear people say, oh, ha, 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 yeah, supersymmetry is so minimal, it doubles the number of particles. Yeah, that's really minimal, ha, 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 right? Um, but I, I think that's completely the wrong way to look at things. Okay? Because all these extra particles that we've added are related by, in fact, a space-time symmetry to the particles we already know we have, with the exception of that we need one additional Higgs doublet. So I think a fair way to say it is that we've added one Higgs doublet to the theory. And we've had to impose some global symmetry or symmetries to get rid of some terms that are otherwise allowed. Okay, so if you compare that to any other sort of uh, extension of the standard model, believe me, I'm a, I'm a model builder, this is fantastic, this is absolutely amazing, 
Okay? In fact, it sort of hints that maybe we're moving in the right direction. We could be going towards simplicity. Unfortunately, this is not going to this, uh, this assessment is not going to survive when we look at supersymmetry breaking. Okay? So let's look at it. All right? So <clears throat> we need to break supersymmetry. It's crucial that we break supersymmetry because none of these additional particles that we've added have we seen in nature, so we need them to be sufficiently heavy to avoid uh, detection. So let's take this phenomenological approach of just breaking supersymmetry softly. Okay? Then we know that we can have gauge-geno masses okay, for all of the, 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 the gauge, gauge-genos. And I've introduced a notation here. We have the Bino, the Wino, and the uh, uh, Gluino. Okay, I don't know why this is up here. It should be down here. Okay. We also have scalar masses for all of the scalars, okay? And so, uh, and again, I've shown the generation indices. So I and J run from one to three. They run over the generations. We have, we have masses for the left-handed squarks, okay? The right-handed up squarks, the right-handed down squarks. Now, everybody knows that scalars cannot be left-handed and right-handed, but I'm using this language to emphasize you know, which is commonly used to emphasize what the scalar is a superpartner of, right? Okay? Um, if you're keeping track, if you give details, you'll notice that I've suddenly started using capital H's for the scalar fields. I cannot stand to use small H's for the scalar fields. I'm sorry. I can't stand it, so I'm going to be a little inconsistent and use capital H's. Then we can also write these holomorphic cubic terms, right? So for every superpotential coupling, we could write a three scalar coupling. And notice, see, the tilde means the superpartner. So the H's don't have a tilde on them because they are the things that, you know, they are the scalars. One of linear combination of H up and H down has actually been seen. So the tildes are the mythical beasts that we haven't seen yet. Okay? So these are three scalars here, three scalars, three scalars. I've indicated the, the flavor indices. So it's very important, it's an extremely important point that we'll return to later, that all of these parameters have flavor indices. That if we want to break supersymmetry, we have to say something about the flavor structure of all of these terms. Okay? And then finally, we have, because we have one quadratic term in the superpotential, we have a holomorphic quadratic term as a soft breaking term as well, which is H up, H down. Okay? So there are other kinds of terms that you can write down which are technically soft that do not arise, this is what I said earlier, they do not arise from higher components of superfield couplings. Um, so these are unlikely to arise from UV complete models of SUSY breaking, so we're not going to worry about them. In any case, we certainly have a lot uh, to worry about already. Okay? I think this is pretty much where I'll stop. Yeah, next time, it's, un it's a little unfortunate we're stopping here because we're right on the threshold of being able to talk about the Higgs potential. But I think I'll, I'll stop here and uh, take some questions. Thank you.